Welcome to the fifth segment of these lectures on uh, environmental ethics and sustainability. Uh, I'm now going to talk about the third of those um, economic approaches to the environment, and this approach will probably carry us through to most of the rest of the set of lectures. The first one was that you, there's uh, once a system of property rights is set up, um, then people should just behave, respect those property rights, and that's all there is to uh, protecting the environment. And that probably doesn't go very far, but it is popular with libertarians and contractarians. Second view was that if you could just privatize the whole environment, then people would look after it, and we could in, in get through the coast theorems, that perhaps, um, solutions to all environmental problems. And that uh, we saw had some drawbacks too. Environmental economics is the view that we can um, that we can measure uh, in an economic sense the um, the um, environmental impact of um, ex external costs of, of our market activities, and we can make strategic decisions, uh, cost-effective decisions on how to uh, reduce pollution and reduce uh, overuse of resources. Okay, and it falls within the, uh, oh my heavens, what's happened? We, it falls within the um, economic utilitarian um, approach to the environment. Um, the, um, we're trying to maximize, um, when we found that, we're trying to maximize aggregate human welfare it's anthropocentric, of course, an instrumental value of the environment. We've um, we found that uh, because uh, be, the ec the market economy will only maximize welfare in conditions of perfect competition, and when there are market failures like external costs, like environmental pollution, then uh, the the um, the argument breaks down. So environmental economics is a way to fix the argument. How how, how can you fix the problems? caused by pollution in the most cost-effective way possible. And it's going to involve a discussion of cost-benefit analysis and um, sustainability into the future, discounting, and so on. All right, now I just want to talk, just briefly introduce you to this idea of environmental ethic, economics and its related concept of the socially optimal level of pollution. Um, so the definitions of this, it's like regular economics, only it's actually a little bit uh, reversed. Your curves seem to go the, the opposite way, as you'll see in a second. Uh, it starts with, instead of supply and demand curves, it uses the notion of the marginal damage, which is the measure of the social costs imposed, imposed on everyone by an additional increment. Okay, marginal damage, an in, uh, additional damage, uh, incremental damage. And the marginal abatement cost is the measure of the cost of decreasing pollution by an increment, whatever your increment is, say, tons of pollutants. And it's marginalist economics, so basically uh, you try to, if the marginal damages are greater than the uh, marginal uh, abatement cost of cleanup, then you should probably clean up. But once you get beyond that point, when the cleanup costs are, are greater than the damage costs, all measured in dollars and cents, using willingness to pay, etc., etc., then uh, you should stop. So the maximal utility is where uh, marginal damages equals marginal abatement costs. And this point is called the socially optimal level of pollution. It's the point at which people consider the financial cost of reducing pollution by an increment to outweigh the cost uh, that that increment of uh, pollution imposes. Now here's a picture. All right. Um, the, here's uh, the emissions of pollution here uh, along this axis. And notice that uh, they increase along this axis. The costs um, and damages, the incremental costs, are measured on this scale. The marginal damages, this, which is this darker line, this, the marginal damages go up with, um, with emissions. And the marginal abatement costs are zero at full, when the economy is going full out and nobody's uh, cleaning up, no cleanup. And they, they rise as the... Um, as uh, as the as the environment is cleaned up, that that sort of makes sense. If you think of I don't know, cleaning a room, right? The, the easiest thing to do is tidy up. Then you can go get the vacuum cleaner, make it a little tidier, a bit more costly in time. And when you finally get down on your knees and start scrubbing the floor and using a toothbrush and Q-tips to get everything really really clean, 
don't worry, I'm not that sort of person. Uh, then uh, it becomes really, really expensive. So as you as you reduce the, the cleanliness, as you clean up, it gets more and more costly each increment of uh, of pollution. So this view is credit has criticized by various from various points of view. So um, this, this I'll call it the socially optimal level of pollution view, because. Um, you can think of it from a character-based approach, like our usual summer ways of thinking about uh, environmental, um, uh, sorry, about ethical um, decisions. From the character-based approach, the people who pollute are thoughtless and selfish, etc. Um, from a duty-based point of view, pollution seems to be wrong. Okay, so people have a not to have a duty not to pollute, and uh, so the only permissible amount would be zero. From a rights-based point of view, the external victim of the pollution has a right not to be harmed, so any amount of pollution that harms anybody uh, is a violation of other people's rights. A justice-based uh, view might point out that the people who are benefiting from the activities that cause the pollution are often not those who suffer the burdens. Uh, in uh, Canada, for example, people might uh, burn a lot of fossil fuels and they, the warming climate might actually make their, their lives nicer but at the same time the increased uh, problems that are caused may fall on people say in the Mekong Delta which will be flooded and uh, those people will be displaced and um, so the people who benefit from burning all the fossil fuel may not be the same people who pay the costs okay and that and there's no there's no uh, nothing about compensation in this uh, in this thinking the socially optimal level of pollu uh, pollution approach takes into account only those entities which are inside the market, which you can assign a willingness to pay to. And there's all sorts of other things like animals and ecosystems and plants and so on, which may be harmed, which are not taken into account by this way of thinking. So, and finally is a measurement problem. The uh, socially optimal level of pollution approach depends on reducing everything to a willingness to pay. How much are willing, people willing to pay to have their preferences satisfied? Um, and uh, there are problems uh, with, with that as we've, uh, have, as we've seen. And we're going to see more as we go into the cost-benefit analysis. Okay, so here is a question for you. The socially optimal level of pollution is always zero. Is that true or false? Well, I'll come back quickly here. Um, the socially optimal level of pollution, as you saw in that diagram earlier, is not zero. It would be seldom zero. It might be zero if, uh, uh, you know, it's under certain conditions. But um, the socially optimal level of pollution is is uh, is is not always zero. It's uh, usually it's almost always above zero, and that's of course what the duty-based and rights-based people have uh, complain about. Okay, so that is a brief introduction to this environmental um, economics field, and we'll come back and look at some applications through cost-benefit analysis and discounting the future and so on, and look at some of the ethical problems that are involved in that.